Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God, we ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information. From the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious, it's fun, it's your Catholic Drive Time. And welcome to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Today is Monday, December 4th, 2023, the Feast of St. Anno of Cologne. Born in 1010 and living to 1075, he was a significant figure in the early Holy Roman German Empire. He was not only recorded in history, but also celebrated in the medieval German poem, the the Ananiada. There you go. I totally could pronounce these 11th century German words. In 1055, Anno became the Archbishop of Cologne and held titles such as Professor in the School of Bamberg and Chancellor of the Holy Empire and Founder of Monasteries. Why was he known as the Founder of Monasteries? Well, it was because he played a pivotal role in introducing the Cluny Reform in Germany. The Cluny Reform was a very important uh, reformation within the church um, uh, around the monastic life. Monasticism started to go on the downhill started to become more lax, started to be less serious, and they used to start to ease up on their practices, and the Cluny Reform helped to revitalize the monastic life. St. Anno was also known for his majestic bearing, his great oratory skills, and his proficiency in conversation. His classes and talks captivated audiences and earned him admiration for his learning in orthodoxy. Now, their most important and most interesting thing about St. Anno is the, hmm, how will we say, the crisis in the papacy in the time. It's worthy of critical study, in my opinion. In 1062, St. Anno played a crucial role in saving the Gregorian reform during a crisis in the Holy Roman Empire. He intervened when the death of Pope Stephen IX led to a struggle over the recognition of of the elected pope. Now, this story gets really complicated really quickly, but to simplify the story, Pope Stephen the Ninth, he died immediately after being recognized by the Empress at the time. And this was a whole ordeal where the Empress did not want to recognize the Pope. And at this time, it was the emperors and empresses and people in charge, the aristocracy in the Holy Roman Empire, who elected the Pope. Uh, along with the the clergy and the nobility of Rome. After Stephen IX died, the next pope that came in, I believe it was Nicholas II, whenever he became pope, he said that it was the College of Cardinals who should elect the pope. And this is where we get that tradition from to today, which caused a great upheaval amongst the people and amongst the Roman clergy and the Roman aristocracy. But not only did they do did they cause that problem, but it also caused problems with the emperors and empresses. See, the empress at the time refused to recognize him because of this, and it became a whole battle. And so, as chancellor, Saint Anno kidnapped the eleven-year-old future emperor during a journey by boat, a strategic move that became known in history as the coup of Kaisereth. He took the boy to Cologne, convoked a noble's assembly, and was elected the regent. The assembly, after studying the case, determined that Empress Agnes should no longer be the regent in granting the role to St. Anno, the Archbishop of Cologne. On October 27, 1062, St. Anno presided over a synod in Augsburg, and during the synod, the decree of Pope Nicholas II was accepted, and the election of Pope Alexander II was recognized, securing the Gregorian reform. Well, during that time, there was a several anti-popes that were recognized by different people, and it was a whole complicated mess. The article that I was reading to recognize the significance of this time as when we kind of get the modern creation of how we have the papacy until today. Well, kind of, because we've kind of changed the electorate and the way we elect Pope a little bit since then, but that's not here nor there. So St. Anno's actions addressed a conflict over who should elect the Pope, the nobles and clergy of Rome or the College of Cardinals. 
His move favored the latter, which aligned with the Gregorian reform and is seen today and by history as the right move because it was creating a separation from the political sphere in the sense that the aristocracies around the world could not have influence on choosing a pope for their own gain. Now, whether or not that worked out in our favor, sometimes, eh, you know, humans be, will be humans. Now, the empress who supported the anti-pope Honorius II later repented in an extraordinary act of penance. She went to Rome dressed in sackcloth with a rope around her neck seeking public forgiveness from Pope Gregory VII. And Pope Gregory VII sent none other but St. Peter Damien himself to hear her confession. After he did, he was asked by the empress herself to be her confessor. What a grace. So what do we ask for from St. Anno of Cologne on this his feast day? Let us ask for a reform of the church, for a restoration of modern monasticism, so that way we return to the former glory of monastic life, the former penances of monastic life, and that we have a reform of the College of Cardinals, the papacy, and the church as a whole. St. Anno of Cologne, pray, pray for, for us. us. Joining us right now is Rudy Carlos. Good morning to you, Rudy. Hey, good morning, Adrian. Praise be to Jesus. It's good to be here this morning. And I uh, just want to say thank you to all of our dear friends, our dear listeners who uh, contributed to our share last week. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. What an absolute grace. Um, or did you do anything interesting over the weekend? Oh, I'm glad you asked, my friend. I uh, had a really epic bird session this weekend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I went out on my kayak, and I got to tell you, it's, it was just like, you know, sometimes you just you just wonder if God just puts these things right in front of you, you know, because it was a great opportunity for me to reflect on the goodness of God in nature, and just just take a look at that. I don't want to get too green here, but uh, it was a very beautiful thing to see. Well, praise be to God. I'm glad to hear that uh, you enjoyed your your birding session. <laughs> um, we love to hear it. And uh, what did I do this weekend? I did a lot of things this weekend, actually. The number one thing that I will mention, because I I feel like I did more than this, but now it's like all escaping my mind. But yesterday, last night, I went with a friend to uh, go to do uh, posadas. Um, Ooh. And it was really nice. It was the first time I've done it, at least from living memory. And I really enjoyed it. And I was expecting to not know anybody. But somehow, like, all my friends were there. And I had no idea they were going to be there. And I was like, no way. That's wild. So I had a really good time. I very much enjoyed it. So uh, thank you to the to the Vera family for generously invited me out to uh to do that with y'all so praise be to god all right coming up in this hour we have a ton to get through uh for instance there was a story recently that came out about uh, pornography and its link with pedophilia a very concerning story and we're going to get to that today uh, plus we're going to talk about the movie lady ballers that the daily wire put out i talked about it on friday and I was mentioning that I will watch it and let y'all know what I thought about it. And, uh, you know, yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. It's, we're <laughs> we're going to discuss this. And one other thing in the next hour, we're going to talk about the judgment, the last judgment, because during the season of Advent, you and I are going to go together through the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So last week we went over death. Today we're going to go over judgment. Next week, we're going to go over hell, and then leading up to Christmas, we're going to go through heaven. Well, we're not going to go to heaven, but hopefully one day. All right, let's begin with prayer. We're going to be praying for your intentions, whatever it is that you have going on in your life. We're going to be praying a prayer to the divine infant king for the month of December. We're going to be praying for the salvation of souls, the liberty, and exaltation of Holy Mother Church, for our friends, family, and benefactors, and all those we promise to pray for, and for healing of my grandfather's cancer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. O divine infant Jesus, I have recourse to thee. Please, through thy blessed mother, assist me in this necessity, because I firmly believe that thy divinity can help me. I hope with confidence to obtain thy holy grace. I love thee with all my heart and with all the strength of my soul. 
I repent sincerely of my sins, and I beg thee, O good Jesus, to grant me the strength to triumph over them. I resolve never more to offend thee, and I come to offer myself to thee with the intention of enduring everything rather than to displease thee. Henceforth, I desire to serve thee with fidelity, and for the love of thee, O divine infant, I will love my neighbor as myself. All-powerful infant, O Jesus, I implore thee again, assist me in this need. Grant me the grace of possessing thee eternally with Mary and Joseph, and of adoring thee with the angels in the heavenly court. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now your headline news with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. You're listening to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. Here are just some of your breaking news and headlines this morning. The COP28 head says there's no science to suggest phasing out fossil fuels as the only way to achieve climate change target. COP head Sultan Al-Jaber faced criticism for disputing the so-called scientific basis behind phasing out fossil fuels to achieve the global warming limit outlined in the Paris Agreement. During an online session, Al Jaber's remarks contradicted the prevailing consensus on the necessity of emissions reduction. Critics expressed concern about the urgency of fossil fuel phase out. Al Jaber's association with the UAE's oil industry raised questions about potential conflicts of interest. The controversy adds to doubts about COP28's effectiveness in addressing supposed climate change as the summit continues in Dubai until December the 12th. Moving on, witnesses testify to torture by Nicaraguan dictatorship at hearing of imprisoned Catholic bishop. Have you heard about this story? Uh, maybe you forgot. We've mentioned it a couple times, but uh, here's an update to the story. The Ortega regime's persecution of the Catholic Church has been highlighted during a congressional hearing. Lawmakers and activists called for the release of the imprisoned Catholic bishop Rolando Alvarez in Nicaragua, alleging mistreatment and possible torture by the Ortega regime. Witnesses, including Nicaraguan exiles, testified anonymously about inhumane treatment of political prisoners. Alvarez was critical of Ortega's human rights abuses and was sentenced to over 26 years in prison. Witnesses recounted disturbing conditions in the Modelo prison, uh, despite the regime's video release uh, reporting favorable conditions. Skepticism persists. Lawmakers, led by Representative Chris Smith, pledged continued pressure and sanctions to secure Alvarez's release. Please continue to pray for him, poor Bishop. He is uh, imprisoned there by himself. And finally, teen girls are being victimized by deep fake nudes across the country. In New Jersey and Washington, recent is incidents involving artificial intelligence generated nude images of high school students have raised concerns, prompting calls for better legal protections. Families affected by deep fake incidents are advocating for robust safeguards urging lawmakers to address the issue with federal federal laws to address the widespread and harmful impact on victims. The cases highlight the escalating problem of explicit artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence generated content with over 143,000 new deepfake videos posted this year, according to independent research. Now, those are some of your headlines this morning, and God bless all of your holy efforts. Stay tuned on Catholic Drive Time for more. The Gospel of the Day comes from Matthew 8, 5 through 11. This is the story of the centurion who asked that he said, I am not worthy that I should enter under my roof, but only said the word and my servant shall be healed. That's where we get that from is from this passage. Now, the only thing I'm going to focus on because we don't have much time is just a really interesting fact that I learned from Cornelius Alapide that I was just kind of mind blown about. He says, Dexter in his chronicle that is lately published, which is kind of funny because lately published, but it's like 600 years old now at this point, it says that this centurion was Caius Cornelius, a Spanish centurion, the father of Caius Opapius, also a centurion, who stood beside Christ on the cross and beheld the signs that were done in heaven and the sun and the earth and the rocks and was converted to Christ. Both father and son afterward preached the gospel in Judea and Spain. That is amazing. That is something that I had never heard before and I thought was really interesting. That this man, who his servant was healed, his son was the at the foot of the cross. They both were converted and they both preached the gospel in Judea and in Spain. What a grace. So let us 
act in the same way and preach the gospel in our neck of the woods. We'll be right back right after this. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say, religion can never depend on minute disputes about doctrine? G.K. Chesterton says that's like saying that life can never depend on minute disputes about medicine. Will the man who says we don't want theologians splitting hairs also say, we don't want surgeons splitting filaments more delicate than hairs? Many a man would be dead today if his doctors had not debated fine shades about doctoring. It's also a fact that Western civilization would be dead today if its doctors of divinity had not debated fine shades about doctrine. We depend on doctors of medicine. We can also depend on the doctors of the church. Want more than a minute? Visit our website, chesterton.org. All my life, I was searching for something that seemed to be just one step away. Perfect soulmate, the ideal job, that big adventure. And just when I thought I found what I was missing, I realized that I was never really fulfilled. Then I discovered what I was searching for was really faith in God and belonging to a church. You can find what you've been searching for too. Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Praise be to God. It's good to be on with you today. There was this movie that came out. I don't know if you heard about it. Well, maybe you did. If you listened to the show last Friday, then you heard about it. Or if you follow the Daily Wire at all. Or really, if you follow anything that talks about pop culture, because this movie exploded in terms of the publicity it got. It was labeled the most transphobic movie of all time. And it was pretty, um, it was pretty bold of them, we'll say. That's what we'll say. <laughs> Rudy's like, is <laughs> like, uh, being very careful with bold. his words. Mm, bold. They're, they're, right. One might say they're being their bold self. That's what, uh, that's what we'll say. Now, let me give you what uh, the Daily Wire said about their own, their own movie. So obviously... They're going to be very positive about their own movie, but here is their report on it. In less than 24 hours since its online premiere, the Daily Wire Plus comedy Lady Ballers has garnished over 1,000 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, boasting an impressive 97% average rating. The the film featuring Daily Wire co-founder Jeremy Boring portrays a former high school basketball coach who adopts radical gender theory, leading his male team to identify as women to dominate women's sports. Reviews applaud its originality and humor, with one stating, I haven't laughed this much in a long time. However, only six reviews are currently visible, with three criticizing the movie as, quote, transphobic and filled with, quote, hatred. Some users report difficulty leaving positive reviews, suggesting Rotten Tomatoes may be hindering submissions. Film critic Christian Toto notes that Rotten Tomatoes is addressing the review bombing attempt by removing reviews posted before the movie streaming availability emphasizing the platform's effort to maintain integrity. So, this is really interesting because in one aspect, I want to support the movie. I like the idea. I like the goal. And I am supportive of trying to make transgenderism something that is acceptable to joke about something acceptable to laugh about. At the same time, the movie itself, it's really hard to say that I can recommend this movie. It was pretty inappropriate. I'm not going to lie. It was pretty inappropriate. I watched it on Saturday. And the movie, first of all, I'm going to be honest, I didn't laugh at any of the jokes. And um, granted, I don't have much of a sense of humor. Uh, at least that's something I've been told. Um, Rudy is looking at me like, that's true. He is, has no sense of humor. And <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know. I don't know. Definitely not for kids. 
any child um, under the age of, I don't know, 16 should definitely not be watching this movie. There is nothing explicit that happened in the movie. Uh, to my recollection, I don't remember any curse words being dropped in the movie. However, there's a lot of in a windows. And one of the things that just oh that bothered me so much was that they had a child actress talk about transgenderism and a lot of these crazy ideologies. And I'm thinking, do we really want little kids saying these lines and being exposed to this? Now, granted, you know, the chances are they were already were exposed to it. But I don't know. It made me uncomfortable to think about the what was happening on the set of them like teaching the kids this. And that made me a little uncomfortable. It also made me really uncomfortable because I was expecting it to be a these men who were just trying to troll the system. But they made a, one, one character this whole had this drag arc. And you see Jeremy Boring in drag. You see some of these other guys in drag. You had Matt Walsh in a, in a wig. Uh, Matt Walsh did not play a transgender character. And instead, he played a uh, a hippie, happy-go-lucky character. It was very interesting. Yeah, you know, Adrian, one of the things that I thought about when I was watching the preview is, and I remember telling you this, you know, because we were watching it together, and I said, how could they stretch this out to be a full-length film? I, I imagine this being like, a, you know, maybe like a 15-minute, 30-minute funny story and a short film, but uh, to drag it out that long, it's, I don't know, it's so so strange. <laughs> drag it out that long, get it? <laughs> Who said, uh, they said, I don't have a sense of humor, not you. There you go. <laughs> now that the, no, you're right though, because if it was like 30 minutes long, they could have cut out a lot of these things, or maybe even like an hour long. They could have cut out a lot of these things that were just unnecessary. Like, and it's, I struggle to even talk about this because it's a little inappropriate. The There was a character situation where, okay, so Jeremy Boring is this coach. He's trying to start this. Uh, he realizes he can dominate. He's like this coach who he's like, I want to win. Like his only goal in life is winning. And he realizes that he can be a winner if he has his guys pretend to be girls and compete in girl sports. And so then you have this this woman who is playing a journalist come up to him and be like, oh, I totally know this is all fake, but we could totally make some money off of this. And she goes on this whole thing, but then they add in this like sexually dominant theme where she is is like sexually coming on to this guy to like lead him on and it never shows anything explicit but it kind of has this innuendo that plays throughout the whole movie and it just made me really uncomfortable the whole the whole movie to watch so i don't know i don't really think i can recommend this movie i am glad that they are trying to push the overtune window in this way I don't think this is the way to do it. I think it was a little inappropriate. You know who was funny, though? Uh, Michael Knowles and Brett Cooper were actually hilarious. Uh, they were the <laughs> only people that I actually was, like, chuckled at. They had some scenes. where So they were they were anchors of a TV show, of a, of a newscast, who accidentally recognized that the transgender people or the, the pretending to be transgender people were actually men. And they got kicked off of their show, got sent to the uh, diversity inclusion training, and then afterwards came back and were like completely woke and were like, oh, yes, we completely support gender ideology and please don't <laughs> shoot us. <laughs> Basically, they look like it was, it was pretty funny. That was the only part where I was like, that's actually that's actually a good bit. Um, but that's the thing. It was a bunch of bits. It was a bunch of things that could have been like just little skits it could have been exclusive content for you know the daily wire you go on their website you sign up for their uh their premium package and then you get access to this but uh, yeah like a whole film i'm not sure yeah so anyway that's 
that's the story with it. Uh, people are coming out. So, okay, let's. So that's the bad news. Let's talk about some good of it because there was some good of it. The people who um, <laughs> the people who hated this film, all the right people hated this film. So the the transgender activists exploded on the internet. They were losing their absolute minds over this movie. And it was pretty amusing to see them lose their minds. A number of interviewers are I saw one person with which what was it? It was was it called it was one of those pop culture YouTube channels that uh pretends to do philosophy and they don't do philosophy <laughs> to say the least. Well, this this channel, and I'm forgetting the name of it. If it remind, if it pops in my head, I'll I'll let you remind you of what what the name of it was. But this channel was talking about it, and they were saying, "Look, we here are very open minded, and we like to have all these ideas. Um, but ideas that are transphobic? No, of course we would never do anything like that." And so I said, we're not even going to watch this movie, and we don't even think we can have a conversation about the, the this topic. And it went on and on and on about how they would never even watch the movie because of how transphobic it is. The thing is, one thing that this movie does really well is expose the lies of transgenderism. Because transgenderism is utter absurdity when you recognize the situation of putting a man in female situations. And that's kind of, I guess that's an element of why it bothered me so much and why I didn't laugh is because it was all real. Like if it was made like maybe 10 years ago, it might've been more funny. Like for instance, these men, these two of these men are identifying as transgender are competing in women basketball. And so they go into locker rooms with a bunch of women and the bunch of women are showering and they walk in and these guys are kind of, um, uh, they're very, they're, they're inappropriate guys. We'll, we'll say. And so they're trying to like pee- be peeping toms basically. And Jeremy boring goes and drags them out of the, out of the women's bathroom. And, and it might be played for laughs, except these things are actually happening. Um, men are going into women's restrooms and doing this. Uh, We've seen so many reports from female prisons, from schools of women, of men doing this, of girls and men and women getting raped in their bathrooms because trans people who identify as transgender are going into their restrooms. So that made me really uncomfortable, but it's actually happening. Uh, One of the scenes I sees uh, these men, they're like, why are we going to stop at women's basketball? We could do all the women's sports. And you see them start doing a montage of them doing all these women's sports and just dominating all of them. And it made me uncomfortable because you could see like this guy, this hulking dude, pick up a girl while they're wrestling and just slam her into the ground. Which just reminded me of the scene which happened in real life where one of the MMA guys fought in the women's MMA because which women's MMA shouldn't exist. But he fought in women's MMA. And crack the skull open of one of the girls. Like these things are actually happening, which makes all these things very, very uncomfortable. The little girl was being my uh, brainwashed in the schools, and she would come home, and she's the one who explains to her dad how this whole transgender thing works and how they can do this. They can, um, this is how, this is the different identifications, and it basically explained all these things. And it might be played for laughs, except that's actually what's happening to kids. Kids are actually being indoctrinated in these ideologies. And so maybe that's why I I didn't find it so funny was because it was too real. The whole thing is things that are actually happening. And I guess the only thing that's funny is that no one has been as bold to do what the Daily Wire has done and to actually make fun of it and to play it for laughs. Uh, But... Nonetheless, I probably would not recommend this to kids. If you're a grown adult, well, you make your own decisions. Um, I didn't really see anything blasphemous. Didn't see any cursing. No anything explicit. Just a little uncouth. Just a little uncomfortable. So up to you. If you watched it, I want to know what you thought. Give me your thoughts. Send me a message, an email. 
or hop on our social media feeds. But we'll be right back with more Catholic Drive Time right after this. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say, I accept some of the things the church teaches, but I could never embrace the entire creed because there are some things in it that I just don't have any use for. G.K. Chesterton says, you might as well say that there's a great many things in the Encyclopedia Britannica that you don't have any use for. The church, like the encyclopedia, is meant for everybody and not just for you. It is meant for everybody, which just happens to include you. The Catholic Church is a combination of things that are nevertheless one thing. We cannot accept only part of it without rejecting all of it. Want more than a minute? Visit our website at www.chesterton.org. So many of us carry such heavy burdens. She's having a relationship with George. It's disgusting. It's dis Deep within, we struggle because sin separates us from God. But thanks to the grace of confession, God compassionately listens, forgives, and sets us free. So if it's been a while since you've been to confession or mass, come home and experience a fresh start. Visit catholicscomehome.org. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm Rudy Carlos, and here are more breaking news and headlines for you. The Archbishop of uh, Denver talks about marijuana. Archbishop Samuel Aquila of Denver recently gave an interview explaining his decision to publish a pastoral letter against legalized and recreational marijuana, saying, quote, the legalization of marijuana and cultural acceptance of drug use has been disastrous to our society and there are limited Catholic resources about it. Drugs diminish our self-possession by harming the very faculties that make us human. They inhibit our use of reason, weaken our will's orientation towards the good, and train our emotions to expect quick relief and artificial pleasure, he warned. It's a great letter. I recommend you check that out over at Catholic News Agency. And here's another one. Did you know anything about the Advent wreath? Do you know where it came from? Why we do it? Where? Which one do you light first? Which candle do you light first? Well, check out this other article on Catholic News Agency. Headline is everything you need to know about Advent wreaths. Now, during the holidays, Catholic homes are adorned with nativity scenes and Christmas trees, and they often include Advent wreaths. Traditionally crafted from evergreen branches, these wreaths bear four candles symbolizing the four weeks of Advent. Three purple candles signify, signify prayer, penance, and preparation for Christ's arrival, while a rose-colored candle represents joy and is lit on Gaudete Sunday, marking the midpoint of Advent. The Advent wreath's evergreen branches symbolize eternity and God's unending love. The blessing of the Advent wreath typically occurs on the first Sunday of Advent and is often performed by the head of the home. So if you don't have one yet, I recommend, I don't know, maybe this is the year you you create an Advent tradition and live liturgically in your home. Those are all of your headlines this morning. And thank you so much for listening to Catholic Drive Time. God bless all of your holy efforts today. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. Rudy, do you do that? Yeah, I do, actually. We uh, set it out. And it's really beautiful, actually, to... Uh, you know, to to see my wife. By the way, please keep my my wife in your prayers today. Uh, today is her birthday, so if you could hey! say a, 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 a hail mary for her, please. Uh, you know, we we always love the prayer. Um, but it's beautiful to see her blossom into her Catholic motherhood and uh, create these wonderful traditions in our home. And so uh, we got these uh, these. Uh, I think they're like sheets of beeswax and different colors, and we rolled them up together with the kids, and it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. So, praise yeah. be to God. That's it's, really neat. It's pretty neat. Uh, yeah, I liked it a lot. What are your uh, what are your what does your daughter think about it? Well, I think she just likes blowing out the candle. To be honest with you, <laughs> what do y'all do? Y'all, because um, I always wonder about this because I'm always like, okay, do we just light it? Over dinner, do we leave it lit all the time? Like, how does what do y'all do? So, what we do is uh, we prepare our dinner, 
And uh, we like to sit together and have dinner together. So uh, we prepare, we have a seat, then we light the candle. And typically we'll say a, a prayer, you know, or um, in the past we've had uh, moments where we will sing a psalm or something about patient waiting, and uh, then we participate in our meal, and then we extinguish the flame after we're done. Mm. Well, pretty pretty simple, God. but there's no formula, really. I mean, you, yeah, there's not. There's no formula, so you can make up your own Advent tradition there. Yeah, there's no right way or wrong way to do it. And here's the thing. I would recommend to people to sit down with your spouse and think about a, a good way to do this because it can become a family tradition. Yeah. Your kids will do it. Your grandkids will do it. Your great-grandkids will do it. So give us some thought and do something very intentional. I think that would be that's such a good idea, Rudy. I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. That's awesome. Well, praise be to God. Okay, so on to so away from encouraging news. <laughs> why are we, <laughs> we way too positive? We want to edify people today. <laughs> no, uh, no. Actually, this isn't this isn't bad news. The here is a story out of Scanner. Um, I think it's it's actually it's pronounced Scanner, but it's S C N R. I don't know why they didn't just add an A there. Otherwise, oh, you know. Uh, it's too expensive to buy that domain. It probably stands for something is my guess. <laughs> that's that's my guess. But uh, reporting from Scanner, they say Texas nationalist movement secures enough signatures to put proposition to secede on the ballot. And who had that on their bingo card? <laughs> um, what? <laughs> so this is really surprising to me. Voters in Texas may be asked about their interest in leaving the union next spring thanks to a grassroots campaign led by National Secession Group to secure enough public support. This is very, very interesting. I, yeah, this is very intriguing to me because people have been talking about this for years. And it's always been more of a, a meme than anything. Because people were like, oh, yeah, we could totally secede. And everybody says, no, you really can't. Now, granted, this is not saying that we will secede, simply voting on whether or not we want to secede, which is interesting. So it says here the, the TNM, the Texas Nationalist Movement, lobbied for the Texas referendum during every legislative session since it was founded in 2005. That just tells you the squeaky wheel Definitely does get the grease. You just got to be persistent, right? It's like our Lord said, knock and, you shall, uh, knock and the door shall be answered unto you. Uh, the scripture commentators talk about this meaning persistence. Uh, like the guy who knocks on the door of their neighbor asking for bread. And the guy is like, no, go away. You're coming in late at night. And you keep knocking. Eventually, he's going to get up and he's going to help you. So there you go. They, it works out for them, I suppose. They estimated that over 600,000 Texans support the movement. For a free and independent Texas, supporters of the effort needed to collect 97,709 signatures by December 1st for the non-binding referendum question to appear on the ballot. Yeah, isn't that interesting? A non-binding referendum? Why, why even do that? Isn't that basically just a glorified poll? So the TNM understands the fundamental relationship between our unique culture and independence, states the organization. We have been at the forefront of preserving, educating, celebrating, and defending Texas history and culture. So there you go. In a letter, TNM President Daniel Miller asked the state Republic Executive Committee to vote in favor of the referendum appearing on the next year's ballot, as such questions could offer necessary clarification and guidance on some of the greatest concerns of Republic voters, Republican voters. So they go on further talking about this and it's pretty, a pretty fascinating situation because there's always been a debate on whether or not Texas can actually secede. And they kind of address it a little bit here. They said in the 1990s, a group called the Republic of Texas argued that the state was never legally admitted into the United States and thus was still its own nation. After splintering, the movement culminated in 1997 in a week-long standoff between police and a secessionist leader who had taken a couple hostages in West Texas. The man, Richard McLaren, believed that Texans, or Texas rather, had been illegally annexed by the federal government, and he remains in prison to this day. So, you know, the United States does not like it when people try to leave the Union. Anybody remember 
the Civil War. Uh, hopefully nobody remembers from memory. I don't think anybody's that old. But the situation there was they tried to secede, and the United States, these United States of America, does not like it when people try to uh, to get out. And so I really don't think this is going to go anywhere. I highly doubt it's going to go nowhere. And, you know, it might, it'd be interesting, though, to see what what the reaction of Texas politicians will be if there is a plurality or at least a a sizable minority that votes, yes, we do want to secede because it won't happen, but it will send a message to the Republican Party and to politics in general in America and well in America, but also Texas uh, more importantly or more specifically in Texas, but it will have reverberations throughout the United States to recognize, holy moly, people do not want to be a part of this union. People are sick and tired of the federal government imposing its will upon the states. And like I said, it won't happen. And, you know, in my idealistic world, I would I kind of want Texas to secede, especially if I will become the monarch of Texas, uh, which clearly that will happen if this happens. Uh, there's no dispute on that, of course. And However, at the same time, the question remains of how this would work, practically speaking, in terms of money. Will we stay in the U.S. dollar? The military, we have the majority of special forces come from Texas. Uh, what will happen to them? Will they uh, become, will they leave the special forces, the United States military, and join the, United, the join Texas's military? Uh, how will that work agriculturally? Yeah, we have a lot of agriculture, but we still import a lot from other places in the United States. How will that work for trade? We have tons of energy. We have our own power grid, so that's okay. There's just tons and tons of questions. I don't know. If you're interested in this question, let me know because uh, maybe we can get someone from the Texas movement to come on and talk about it, defend their position. I'd be very interested in hearing how they think this is possible. Uh, not, not super supportive of the idea. I do think it's interesting, and I am glad that it's going to send a message to our politicians. But nonetheless, that's what's up. All right, we're going to be right back with more talking about pornography and creating pedophiles. Yikes. We'll be right back right after this. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, get past those challenges, and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. My heart wasn't really in um, my faith. There was more to life than what I was doing. I walked into the church and I really believed that uh, putting my hand in the holy water that it was going to bubble over and the church was going to collapse. And I was really nervous. I couldn't imagine life without being a part of the church. When I walk in the doors of the Catholic Church now, I feel alive, complete, and at home. If you've been away from the Catholic Church, visit catholicscomehome.org. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Praise be to God. It's good to be on with you today. It's always good to be here with you. No matter what happens in the world, it's always good to be here with you. I can always look forward to coming in and spending my morning with you. So praise be to God. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you. I I very much appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Okay, so there was a story from LifeSite News, and it was it was pretty rough. I'm not going to lie. I was reading the story, and just reading the story made my heart sink. And I almost, I was like, oh, 
I don't really want to talk about this because it kind of makes me depressed. Uh, but then I realized this is actually very important because parents need to realize that this is happening. And I don't know how much information parents need to know before we say, let's just smash cell phones, destroy them all. Uh, so here's a story from LifeSite News. Uh, porn makes pedos is what I'm saying here. The normalization of sexual violence is linked to the widespread portrayal of men as aggressors in countless porn scenes, leading to concerning statistics. Studies reveal that a significant percentage of young boys view pornography as a source of ideas for sexual acts and believes in it presents a, quote, realistic depiction of sex. Yikes. Alarmingly, one in ten men have been involved in sex offenses against children either online or offline. Now, okay, I'm curious to know what that means, practically speaking. Now, obviously, a sexual offense against children offline is very clear what that is. That's, I mean, you can just imagine. Uh, but a sexual offense against a child online, does that mean interacting with a child directly? Or are we talking about consuming pornography that involves a child so you're not directly interacting with a child indirectly interacting with that child the reason why i wonder is because one in ten for someone being actively being a sex offender against children that's massive that is a massive number and kind of like made my jaw hit the ground if one in ten includes men watching pornography that involves children, it still is very, very concerning, but it it is less, less jaw-dropping uh, because we know that a number, a, a ridiculously high percentage of pornography on pornography sites involve children and whether or not the consumer of it knows it's children or not because they will... Um, Obviously, they don't, they're not going to tell you unless these people are looking in the dark web, which I think most people don't do that. I don't know. However, yeah, the, the pornography sites are filled with people who are actually being raped in real life. Like they're not acting. They're re actually being raped. Uh, people who have been kidnapped or are sexual slaves, human trafficking, and people who are children, which I guess a lot of these are overlapping categories. And so, yeah, those things happen. But most people who consume the pornography are not aware of that. And so obviously it doesn't make it okay. And any kind of pornography, whether or not the people are consenting adults or not, is all bad and should be made illegal. So I'm not making a defense for these people. I simply am just jaw dropped by one in 10 men being involved in sexist defenses against children. And I'm trying to figure out what that means because it's, it's insane. It's utter insanity to think one in 10. One in 10 is massive. That means if you're in a room of 100 men and there's 10 people there who have committed a sex offense against a child. So I, I hope it's what I'm saying and not a directly involved in sexual offenses against children uh, online or offline. So that's I would be curious to know that what that means specifically. Now, additionally, there is a rise in child-on-child -child sexual assault in the emergence of porn-made pedophiles, individuals who initially are not attracted to children but influenced by escalating porn content. Now, this is also something that needs to be focused on. This is really a big deal because we're seeing this come up with the transgender movement, with the homosexual movement. And nobody wants to talk about this because this is incredibly taboo. This is incredibly politically incorrect to say that pornography is creating homosexuals is creating transgenders and it is creating pedophiles how does this happen uh, people start watching pornography and these pornography they're watching it starts off maybe something that is very uh what people might refer to as vanilla that's something just very normal what you would expect between a married couple and then it starts to escalate into weirder and weirder things. And uh, here's the one thing. I was talking to a, a friend about this, actually. It was, it was kind of funny. He was, he was telling me, he said, uh, any guy 
who watches pornography is gay. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you're watching a guy have sex. So that's pretty gay. Like if you went into a room where your friend was having sex with his wife or with his girlfriend or whatever, that would be a really homosexual thing to do because you're getting aroused by a man doing things. So that is inappropriate. It's very inappropriate. And so that's what's happening in pornography. And that's what people are doing. And so what that does is it creates people to move further and further down that path. And so you start seeing a rise in homosexuality. You see a rise in transgenderism. There's been a num- number of people who come out and they publicly have talked about how they were, they had become a transgender because of the pornography they were watching. They have this pornography that is just so bad, so inappropriate, and so perverse that it's brainwashing people into becoming transgender. Grown men, grown men are talking about this. And so if this is affecting grown men who have full control of their faculties, who have a fully developed brain, what do you think is doing to your children? What do you think is doing to your kids who are getting exposed to this at a younger and younger age? I remember when I was in high school and people were talking about pornography, they were saying that the average age for people being exposed to pornography was, I believe, 15 years old. And now, I last thing I looked, I think it was like, Eight. Eight years old. And if you give technology to your kids, like obviously if you don't give technology to kids, they still might have a chance of finding it. But if your kid has access, free access to the internet, there's a high degree of chance that they're going to be exposed to this, especially if they have social media. Because most social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or I guess X now, uh, TikTok, all these things they put basically soft core pornography. Uh, it's very, very bad. What people would see in Playboy magazines 30, 40 years ago is what you see on social media. And then it's only a, a short hop and skip over to actually get pornography. And it's really bad too because the they create these, what people refer to as porn bots on the social media feeds, which will spam uh, people's comments, their likes, their follows. And what happens with these with these people is they will be fake accounts of inappropriate pictures of his profile picture and that has links over to pornography sites. And they do this because people like to click on to see who's liking their videos or pictures, things like that, who's commenting on their stuff who's following them and you click on it and then you are exposed to this stuff. So your kids could be exposed to it that way as well. And there's no way to block that. The it's, it's happening across the board. Everybody's complaining about it on the internet, but they haven't figured out a way to prevent it. Or maybe they don't want to prevent it. I don't know if you want to be conspiratorial about it, but this is really bad. These things are happening and there's not really a way to prevent them from doing it. If you have the only way is to get them off of social media Get them off the internet. That's it. And no other way is possible. There's no other way possible. These these apps to try to help prevent them from watching these things, like Covenant Eyes and these other similar groups, are good. And they're helpful. They're better than nothing. But they are not actually solving the problem. They're not actually going to prevent it from ever happening. It's going to reduce the chances you're going to be doing a better job. And certainly if you have your kids have these devices, then you should be using those things. Uh, but it's not going to be a 100% prevention. Now, the article also talks about efforts to combat this issue, including initiatives like Stop It Now, which is collaborating with platforms like Pornhub. However, there is a need for more substantial actions such as banning pornography and prosecuting those distributing harmful content. Now, I don't know why this is not already happening. Now, current attempts at re-education are deemed insufficient, and a robust approach is required to curb the adverse effects impact of pornography on society. Serious conversations with boys about the harmful effects of porn and its contribution to sexual violence are crucial for meaningful change. 
The alarming scale of the problem demands decisive action from policymakers, academics, journalists, and global leaders against the porn industry's role in perpetuating harm. So that's the article. I recommend reading the whole article because he lays out, uh, Jonathan Van Maren is the author of the article, lays out a bunch of the statistics about that are, that are mind-blowing. Uh, here's one statistic that kind of blew my mind. The rise in women looking at pornography is very concerning. I believe it was 34% of women, of girls, it says, are watching pornography. That's very, very concerning because it's going to put the image of those things into the minds of girls saying that they shaping what they expect the marital act to be. Uh, here's the here's the statistic. A 2016 study, that's probably worse now, found that 53% of 11 to 16-year-old boys and 39% of 11 to 16-year-old girls said that they believe pornography was a realistic depiction of sex. That is humongous. That is humongous. If that's what they if that's what they think is a real election, realistic depiction of the marital act, no wonder no wonder society is absolutely perverse and falling apart. A 2021 study found that 24.5% of young adults cited pornography as the most helpful resource for learning how to have sex. This is absolutely horrific. And honestly, I think the reason why the majority of policymakers and politicians haven't done anything about this is probably because they're ashamed because they're looking at it too. So it needs to be banned. It needs to be stopped. And your kids need to be informed about this because like it or not, they probably already know what it is. As young as like seven or eight year olds, statistically, that's the majority. So protect your children, get that stuff away, and let's pray for an end to this evil. We'll be right back with more right after this. So many of us carry such heavy burdens. Come on, babe. It'll be fun. It's just you and me. Deep within, we struggle because sin separates us from God. But thanks to the grace of confession, God compassionately listens, forgives, and sets us free. So if it's been a while since you've been to confession or mass, come home and experience a fresh start. Visit catholicscomehome.org. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Who are the 10 most well-known preachers in America? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Here's the list. Copeland, Osteen, Benny Hinn, Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, Andy Stanley, Robert Jeffers, Rick Warren, Alistair Begg, John MacArthur. Well, secondly, all these pastors say the same thing on Sunday morning, which is, turn with me in your Bible. Well, then how's the harmony regarding, say, eternal security, disagreement, present-day ministry of the Holy Spirit, Disagreement. Relationship of baptism to salvation. Disagreement. Church government. Disagreement. Life beginning at conception until natural death. Disagreement. And eschatology. Disagreement. So what's going on here? Well, if you are someone who says, all I need is the word of God, brother, because the Bible is going to give me everything I need to live out the Jesus life. Okay. Hope you've already ditched your favorite blogger, your favorite preacher, your favorite podcaster, and most of all, your religious Google searches. Well, speaking of Google searches, I do request one last Google search for you. Magisterium. Ever feel like life's just too busy and too much? There's constant noise, social life, traffic, work, paying bills. It just doesn't seem to let up. Well, maybe it's time for a change. See, God offers us relief and hope. So if you're feeling like you need more peace and less chaos, find your hope today. Begin at CatholicsComeHome.com. I'm in a good place in my life. And I'm energized by new adventures. I've got friends to laugh with. And a good relationship. But even though I'm kind of comfortable, I sometimes wonder, is there something more? 
Could God and church be what you're looking for? Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. Praise be to God. It's good to be on with you today. You know, there is a tradition in the church of recognizing the season of Advent as a time to look forward to the Advent, Advent meaning the coming, the coming of Christ. Now, obviously, most people think about the coming of Christ in the nativity, and other people might say, oh, yeah, we, the coming of Christ into our hearts. That's also good. It's also a very good and worthwhile thing to think about. But also, the coming of Christ and his second coming. That's the thing that is actually the most primary thing to think about. Because the season of Advent is typically done a series of sermons on the four last things. And if you get a sermon on the four last things, I'd be very curious to know if you get one. Uh, So let me know what you think or what you heard, if you heard his sermon on the four last things. And what are the four last things? Death, judgment, hell, and heaven. Those are the four last things. So last week we talked about hell, getting ready for Advent. It's a shorter Advent this year. And then we have today, judgment. For at the advent of the second coming of Christ, there will, in fact, be judgment. There will be the general judgment that happens. But also when we die, it is appointed for man wants to die and then judgment. Now, where I'm getting my information from today is from Father Von Kocham. He was a Franciscan friar in the 17th century, and he, well, I guess he, he died in 1712, but he, was, he lived mostly in the 17th century, and he wrote a very, very good book, which is in the public domain, so you can get it for free online if you wanted to read it online. There's also people who've read it on YouTube, and you can listen to it there, or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon or wherever else. Um, very much worth getting. The book is called The Four Last Things, Death, Judgment, Hell, and Heaven. And in this book, he talks about the woe of the advent of the judge whenever a Christ comes to judge you. So here he says, What we have hitherto heard, O Christian reader, is indeed most fearful and terrible, but it is nothing in comparison with what we are now about to consider. So he's talking about the meditation on death that we went through last week. He's saying what we meditated upon on death and how bad death is and how gruesome death is and how sad death is, is nothing compared to judgment. He says, for the coming of the judge will be so awful, so dreadful, that all that is in heaven or upon earth will tremble and quake. He said, the power and majesty wherewith he will come is beyond the power of words to describe in order that we may know something concerning it and be able to form some words of conception of it. Christ has himself foretold his coming in these words. In Matthew 25, he says, when the son of man shall come in his majesty, and all the angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his majesty, and all nations shall be gathered together before him. And again, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with much power and majesty. Thus we see our Lord assert twice that he will come in the clouds of heaven, attended by his all his angels in the great might and majesty. Now, this is important to note because uh, people have this pop culture idea that Christ will come again, like being reborn, like reincarnation. There's people who talk about, oh, this is the Messiah, and it's secretly the Antichrist. It's a really popular theme in in horror movies. And that's not how Christ will come again. Christ will not come again as a babe. He's not going to appear as some random person walking the streets 
Because our Lord came in his nativity, humble, as a babe in a manger. He died a most humiliating death on the cross. He comes to us in the Holy Eucharist as humble, as appearance of bread and wine. He allows himself, humbled himself, to present himself in a way that we can desecrate him, that we can offend him, that we can blaspheme him. We have that freedom to do evil towards God. But when he comes in his majesty, when he comes in his second coming, it will not be like the nativity. It will not be like his crucifixion. It will not be the same way he walked the earth. It will not be like the way it is in the Holy Eucharist. No, he will come in glory. He will descend from heaven the same way he ascended, coming through the clouds. And nobody will mistake him for who he is. This is an important thing to keep in mind. This is very, very hard thing for people to understand with our modern mindset. Now, he says, how we all shall tremble. And I'm also skipping around and all over the place because this is several chapters that he goes through in regards to the judgment. And so we're not going through all of it. And so again, I recommend people to read the whole thing. It's, it's definitely worth reading in its entirety. It says, how we all shall tremble. Oh my God. When we behold these hosts of celestial spirits with their kingly leader, the prophet Daniel once saw an angel and he was so terror struck at his appearance that he fell to the ground like one dead. If such an effect was produced of him by the sight of a single angel whose errand was one of comfort and consolation, what will become of us when so many hundreds of thousands of heavenly princes draw nigh to us with wrathful countenance? St. Ephraim, speaking of this, said, The angels will stand there with a menacing mane, their eyes flashing with the sacred fire of just indignation, roused by the iniquities of mankind. This is important to keep in mind as well. The sacred fire of just indignation. What a beautiful phrase. Think about how wicked we are. How evil we are. I think about this, I had the privilege of making a general confession recently. And when I made the general confession, I was reflecting on all the sins of my life from a child until today. And it struck me. It just, something you don't really think about too much. How horrible we really are. I was thinking about things uh, from when I was a kid, from when I was a teenager, from when I was in college, uh, different things that I've said or done. And just thinking about it, I was like, oh my goodness, my God, why are you so merciful to me? Why have you not struck me dead already? Why do you continue to offer me mercy when I have repeatedly over and over and over over again, offended divine justice, offended divine mercy. I abuse the mercy that God has offered to me. And we recognize that when Christ comes, right now is a time for mercy. But when he comes again, there will be no more mercy. It'll be a time of justice. And the angels and our Lord himself will look upon us with just indignation for our manifold sins. So now is the time to repent, not later. Now is the time to repent while mercy is still available to us. I think about the great, the awesome, amazing, awesome in the most true word, like awe-inspiring. When you look at the cathedral there in Washington, D.C., there is a mosaic of the second coming, and it has Christ there, and there's flames coming out. And you think that will be the judgment. He said, the reader may perchance be inclined to ask the reason why Christ, the same Christ who lived amongst us on earth in all gentleness and meekness, should wear so terrible an aspect when he comes to be our judge. There are a great many reasons why Christ in this capacity should judge mankind with such awful severity. The principal one is because he has been most grievously outraged by the sins of men. 
The theologians assert that every mortal sin is in itself an infinite evil and is an infinite affront to the divine majesty. It is an offense of such magnitude that neither the tongue of angels nor of men is capable of describing it. It will be understood, therefore, that as in every mortal sin there is malice of so deep a die, it must deeply wound the divine heart of Jesus and provoke him to just anger against the individual who has been guilty of that sin. And in order that it may be more apparent how just the ire of God is when roused by mortal sin, it will be well to explain more clearly how great is the insult offered to God by willful sin. He goes on and says, imagine, and so I'm telling you, imagine, the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity to be on one side with their infinite treasures of grace and glory, and on the other side, the spirit of evil with all the punishment and torments of hell, and a man standing in the midst betwixt them, debating with himself whether he should honor, should show honor to God by doing his will, or whether he should act in violation of his will and thereby cause the devils to rejoice. If the man commits the sin, he acts towards God, and God regards his action exactly as if he uttered these blasphemous words or others of the same nature. I do indeed believe, O God, that I was created by thine almighty power, redeemed by thy mercy, made a child of predilection by thy bounty, I know that thou hast promised me eternal life. All the sweetness and bliss of heaven. I am also well aware that this accursed Satan, thy great enemy and mine, is prepared to strip me of all that is good and hurl me down to the everlasting perdition. And yet, because Satan tempts me now, because he suggests to me a thought of unchastity, a desire for revenge, a movement of envy, I choose rather to yield to this impulse and thereby render myself deserving of everlasting punishment and resist and repel the evil suggestion and thus merit heaven hereafter in spiritual grace now. Thereby I deliberately and of my own free will turn from thee, O God. I follow by choice this hateful demon whom I obey in preference to thee. This is what Father Von Kochem is saying that we say every single time we sin. Every single time we sin, those are the words that we are telling to God. That is a situation we put ourselves in when we decide that we are going to love our sin rather than to love God. This judgment will not be, it will not be fun. It will not be a fun situation to answer before the Almighty God whose ways are above our ways. So, Let us say this prayer that Father Von Kochem had composed for us, something that we can meditate upon and we can pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Most most just judge the living and the dead. I acknowledge before thee that I have sinned often and grievously. I have forsaken my Father in heaven. I have crucified thee, my Redeemer, I have grieved the Holy Spirit and trifled away his grace. I have done this by the countless sins I have committed in thought, word, and deed. Through my transgressions I have incurred the penalty of everlasting death. But since thou willest not the death of the sinner, but rather that he should do penance and live, let me experience here the effect of thy justice, which is ever wedded to mercy. All the trials that thou sendest me in this life, I will thankfully receive from thy hand and kiss the rod whereby thou dost chastise me with paternal severity, in order that at the day of judgment I may find mercy, and thou mayest gain and grant me a place in the ranks of thine elect. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So praise be to God. May we make penance now before it's too late. Penance, penance, penance. Let's pray the rosary every day. Ask God for forgiveness. Amend our lives and live a holy life. 
And with that, we're going to go and play our Fear and Trembling game show. Call in 877-757-9424. Now is the time to call. We're going to be giving away prizes this week. 877-757-9424. That number, 877-757-9424. If you want to win a prize, call now. We'll be right back. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard someone say that we should stop opposing things like abortion and homosexual unions because there's simply nothing we can do about it? You can't prevent that stuff. It's inevitable. So just accept it. Well, G.K. Chesterton says the other word for inevitability is impenitence. We have let ourselves be dominated by the notion that there's no turning back. This idea is rooted in materialism and the denial of free will. Now this modern refusal to undo what has been done is not only an intellectual fault, it is a moral fault also. It is not merely our mental inability to understand the mistake we have made, it's also our spiritual refusal to admit that we have made a mistake. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org I might have gone to church, you know, at Christmas time, gradually quit going. Went through a divorce and um, ended up being a single parent. And it was an easy excuse. I, I took the easy out and just didn't go to Mass. When you come home to the, to the church, you're coming home to a Catholic family where people today just embrace you. I have a peace when I walk through the doors of the Catholic Church, like that's where I belong. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. <laughs> the Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. Seven five seven ninety four twenty four. That's the number to call to be part of our game show, Fear and Trembling, where we give out prizes and you could be a winner. Yes, it's true. You can, in fact, be a winner. All you have to do is pick up the phone and dial that number, 877-757-9424. If you call now, then we're going to put you in, well, the chances are you're going to win. So what are you calling in for exactly? What's going on? Here I have... Three Catholic trivia questions. And the trick is, I'm not going to ask you the questions. I'm going to ask Rudy the questions. He's going to give me an answer, and it's your job to tell me whether or not he is right or whether or not he is wrong. Every right answer goes into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Uh, Rudy, what could they win? Praise be to God. This week we're giving away another coffee cup of divine providence. Now, I mentioned to you this at last time. <sighs> The time is coming where it's going to be very difficult for you to receive a coffee cup of divine providence. Mm. If you catch my meaning, things are changing. Things are coming. Things are going, if you get my meaning foreshadowing. Now, if you want to secure this coffee cup of divine providence replica, you're going to want to pick up that phone and call. Uh, let's see. Uh, do we have anybody on the phone yet? Not yet. But you're going to receive this coffee cup of divine providence, and it's going to guarantee your coffee tasting at least 80% better. So wow. call now. And by the way, we'll even sign it for you. Whoa. Adrian and I will just, we'll Jan, John Hancock it for you, and you can put it on your shelf, or if you want, you can just use it. It's up to you. What a grace. What a grace. At least I hope it is to you. Now, that number, if you will, so right now, I have good news for you. There is nobody on the line, so the next person to call in will have that opportunity to win the coffee cup of Divine Providence. That number, 877 877- Seven five seven nine four two four eight seven 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 five seven ninety four twenty four. That's the number to call. And when you call in, if you are a first caller, then you will have a chance to win that prize, that fear and trembling coffee cup of divine providence replica. Not the original. The original belongs to us. Uh, but like Rudy said, this week may be one of the last weeks you'll have to win a coffee cup of Divine Providence. So make sure that you are prepared. 
to try to win that prize. We'll be very grateful to all those who call in and help participate in the opportunity to win the coffee cup at Divine Providence. Uh, but joining us right now, good morning to you. Who's on the line with us? This is David. David. Good morning to you, David. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. Praise be to God. We love it whenever we have our San Antonio callers. Now, where are you off to this morning, David? I'm headed to work. Uh, what do you do nice for work? Breeze. Nice. Uh, I'm in uh, mortgage lending, home mortgage lending, lending, do uh, home equity loans and mortgage loans as well. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, I was trying to figure out. I was looking at houses, and I was thinking, oh, my goodness. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to afford a mortgage. I think I'm going to just. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it, it, it's been tough. It has been tough, but hopefully things will change uh, next year, and people will be able to get into a home with rights coming down and Hopefully, the uh, you know the the prices of houses will come down as well too here in San Antonio. Let's hope. Let's hope, and uh, maybe if uh, it gets cheaper living in San Antonio, maybe I'll move out of Houston and go to San Antonio. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, David. Praise be to God. And what parish do you go to there in, in San Antonio? Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace in San Antonio. Awesome. Well, praise be to God, David. Are you familiar with the game? Do you know how to play? I'm familiar with it. Yes. Awesome. See you guys in the morning. Ah, Deo gracias. Hey, thank We'd you. We love to hear it. We love to hear it. Oh, you're welcome. All right, David. Then you are a veteran listener. You know how the game is played. Uh, let's see how you do. Are you ready to jump into it? Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it, Rudy. Are you ready? Is I am. Question? I'm oh. super ready. Let's do this. Super ready, this, he says. Rudy. Okay. Is that a good sign <laughs> for anybody or is it a bad sign? We'll find out. <laughs> question for you, Rudy. What famous French Catholic engineer was the architect for the layout of the city of Washington, D.C. Ah, yes. yes. That architect. The famous. The famous one. His name was Pierre Eiffel. You no might kidding. recognize him from the Eiffel Tower. No kidding. He actually designed that one, and they loved it so much, they were like, wow, this is incredible. Let's get this guy to design something else for the United States. And they're like, why not the nation's capital? So they flew him in. He, You know, there was a language barrier, of course, but... Yeah, he designed that that layout. Wow, who would have guessed? Um, yes, the famous. Ca- I, I don't. I don't think it's possible to say a famous Catholic engineer, ca- famous French Catholic engineer, because I can't name for you a single French Catholic engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, is there really such a thing as a famous one? But okay, I guess amongst Catholic engineers, maybe amongst engineers, I have no idea. Oh. All right, David, 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is, what famous French Catholic engineer was the architect for the layout of the city of Washington, D.C.? Uh, David from San Antonio, Texas, what say you? Uh, we're sorry. I sorry say. about that. Rudy says Pierre <laughs> Eiffel. Eiffel. And is yeah. he right? Is he wrong? He's wrong. I actually was in D.C. not too long ago, and I got to visit one of the churches. Very interested. See, I can't, I can't remember that person that designed it, but it was like the first Catholic church designed in D.C. And it was a, it was, it was interesting to see because there were tombstones right by the church as well, too. Hmm, and let's then, see. Uh, not too far from that, there was a kids playground, oh, which is very go. interesting to see. But I say he's wrong. Well, he's wrong. All right. Well, let's, let's see. Take a Survey look. says. That You're is correct. Right. It is not Pierre Eiffel Tower or Pierre Eiffel. It's Pierre <laughs> La Eiffel. His middle name was Tower, oh, by the way. Go. Was it really? No. Oh, just... Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, dude! You're just like <laughs> you. You trick me more than you trick the <laughs> listener. <laughs> okay. So the correct answer was Pierre La Eiffel. Uh, probably mispronouncing that, so the, the uh, French people will come after me again. But uh, there is your answer. All right, David, are you ready for question number two? Yes, sir. Let's do it. Question number two for you, Rudy. The church militant refers to members of the Catholic Church residing where? Mm, okay, well, <laughs> that refers to people here on Earth. That refers to you and me and all of the people at the Catholic Church who have received all of those sacraments of initiation. So, people here on Earth. Okay, you're saying the Catholic Church here on Earth. That's all right. right. All right, David. 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is, 
The church militant refers to members of the Catholic Church residing where? Rudy says it's those members of the Catholic Church residing here on Earth. Uh, what say you, David, from Prince of Peace in San Antonio, Texas? Is he right or is he wrong? Let's go with right. Let's go with right, he says. All right. There you go, David. <laughs> Praise David. be to God. Go, Rudy. <laughs> Way to go, David. <laughs> Great, good job, David. You're clearly a man of great intelligence. You have definitely read your catechism. Um, clearly, someone who pays attention at his. Um, oh, do y'all do? Y'all, do y'all do adult for faith formation at Prince of Peace? Uh, do you go to that? We do. We do RCIA. We have. Uh, I'm actually involved in the youth ministry. We're going to have uh, retreats for the youth there in uh, the spring, and one we go to the Steubenville in the summer with hey. the youth. Oh, praise be to God. I never went to a yeah. Steubenville conference. We had an AYC oh. in Houston. Steubie. We never, but I never went to an, a Steubenville conference. But there you go. Praise be to God, David. Uh, very good. You're doing excellent. Are you ready for question number three? I am. All right. So if you get this one wrong, we're going to have to call your parish and let them know that um, <laughs> you're not suitable to be teaching uh, children <laughs> um, the catechism anymore. Or you're, you're fired. It's over. Uh, but let's see if you how you do. A uh, question for you, Rudy. The question on the board is, what sin does one commit who knowingly receives a sacrament while in the state of mortal sin? Sacrilege. That's sacrilege. what they do. They commit sacrilege when they receive a sacrament, knowing full well, you know you you know you have that on your soul. You know you have that mortal sin, you sacralizer. Sacrilege. Sacrilege is what you're going with. All right, David. 15 seconds on the clock. No pressure. Uh, we're just going to contact your parish if you get this one wrong and uh, <laughs> tell them how you're not able to do it. So no pressure whatsoever. Uh, 15 seconds on the clock. What sin does one commit who knowingly receives a sacrament while in the state of mortal sin? Rudy says it's a sin of sacrilege. What say you, David? And he's right. He is right. He says, mm, let's see. Are you sure let's find that? out. Are you sure. Okay. That's correct, David. Yeah. You saved your job. Congratulations. Whew, you I was did. Sweating I, there. <laughs> I almost got fired there. I was worried about you there for a minute. Yeah. Well, praise be to God, David. You did excellent. Three for three. Your name's in the coffee cup of divine providence three times awesome. to win the prize. And you did a wonderful. So now you can um, report back to the team and say, that's right. Catholic trivia. Perfect score, champion. Uh, please give me a pay raise. I double my pay. Uh, so praise be to God, David. Uh, how do you feel? Amen. I feel great. You guys uh, brighten my day. I appreciate that all that y'all do and the, the work that y'all put in and, and your holiness too, guys. I mean, you, you can hear it through the radio. So I really appreciate that as well. Well, thank you very wow, much. You. I appreciate that. Uh, praise be to God. You made my day, so praise David, be to God. You should have kept that to yourself, brother. You just pumped him yeah, up. You, you should see my head right now. Dude, it's like it doesn't it fit in the studio right now. I gotta <laughs> gotta open the doors for a second. So I appreciate it, David. God bless you. God love you. We're gonna put you on hold so we can get your contact information. Uh, but have a blessed day. You too. Thank you. Love All right, putting you on hold. And. That's going to do it for the radio side. If you'd like to join us in the after show, we'd love to have you. Whatever you want to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about that. So questions, comments, concerns, soapboxes, negativities, positivities, or anything in between. Talk about whatever we talked about on the show. Or let's talk about Christmas carols. Whatever it is you want to talk about, we'll talk about it in the after show. Join us, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble. Just jump on and leave a comment. Look up Catholic Drive Time, your favorite social media platform. We'll talk to you there. But if not, we'll see you back here tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, across the Guadalupe Radio Network and Catholic Spirit Radio. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you very soon. And remember, Veni, Veni, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God love you, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.
And we're back. Welcome back to the after show. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. I'd love to be here. And I love interacting with you guys on in the chat. It's always such a blessing. I'd love to see it. So I got a one good comment. Jose, Jose Dominguez says, just saw the Lady Ballers trailer. Looks hilarious, but usually trailers are all the funny parts. That the rest of the movie is kind of boring. Uh, but I'm still laughing about it. Sorry, Adrian. You convinced me to see it. Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't disrecommend it. I do disrecommend it for um, for children. If you're if they have children, I definitely would not recommend it. But to adults, uh, make your own decision. I don't know. Would I watch it again? Definitely not. If you watched it, I'm really curious, though. If, if you watched it, I really want to know what you thought about it because I'm, I'm conflicted about it. You know, it's I, it, it just makes me so uncomfortable seeing guys dressed in, in women's clothing. Like, it's not funny to me. It just makes me uncomfortable. I get it played for laughs, and I get it played for laughs in the past. But it's, I don't know, this has always been uncomfortable to me. It's always seemed very subversive to me. Like, uh, I don't know. This was uh, Adrian's brain whenever there was a joke on that film. So true. Film, quote unquote. So true. <laughs> literally, literally me. I was, uh, <laughs> I literally had crickets. How many, uh, how many notes did you take? None. Um, <laughs> while you're watching the movie, none. <laughs> uh, I, normally I do take notes when I'm doing these things, but honestly, I watched it Saturday at like midnight be, because I was like, oh crud, I said I was gonna watch the movie, and I was busy Friday, I was busy Saturday. Actually, I wasn't busy Friday evening. What I why didn't I watch it Friday evening? I don't remember, but I was busy Saturday and I was busy. I knew I was going to be busy all of Sunday, and so I was like, okay, I better read it. I better watch it tonight. And Friday, so you were it. out on a date. No, I was not out on a date. I was, uh, <laughs> I was uh, home with my little sister. Um, we didn't do anything. Sunday, As you Friday, do. Friday was actually really laid back now that I think about it. I'm trying to think if I did anything. I think I just went home, and that's it. Saturday. Oh, I remember what I did Saturday. So Saturday... I went to, uh, my friend was putting on a sacred music concert, um, Rafael Ramos and his sisters, uh, Maria and Adriana. Um, well, that's kind of rude for me to mention them and not everybody else who was involved, but <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a bunch of people, organists, everything, but Rafa is the one who directed it. He was the director of it, and he had his sisters who were a part of it, and I'm friends with them. And so they asked me if I would record their concert for them. So I recorded their concert, and then I they had a, a little um, little party afterwards to celebrate. And the they had beautiful "Since by Man." Oh my goodness! I'm gonna ask them if I can play it some for some of you. Um, maybe this later this week I'll, I'll play a clip of of the song. But it was oh so beautiful. And the the um, Magnificant, so good, sublime, beautiful, so good. So we did that, and then I met up with some friends in the evening, and then I went home, watched the movie, and went to bed. Hmm. So that's what I did on Saturday. Um, but yeah, that was pretty hectic, hectic day, because setting up this audio equipment and all that stuff, it's it's pretty pretty rough. Uh, Lone Star 187 says, I don't like how they just cast the guys at the Daily Wire. Seems amateur. Like The film was just thrown together because it's the, it's the do your... Do your topic of the day. Oh, doge, de jure topic of the day, month, year. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm trying to. So, okay. In their defense. So in their defense. And like I said, I, I'm. it makes me uncomfortable. I don't really like the movie. But I will do want to defend them in the sense that um, they mentioned that they tried to cast the movie, but no actors would do it because they knew that if they performed in this movie, they would never get a job in Hollywood or any, any other acting career ever. 
And so they tried to get actors to be involved in it, and all of them said no. They said they contacted actors who have already been canceled, and even they were like, no, like this would just, there just wouldn't, there'd be no coming back from this. And so they just didn't, they had to use with who they had. Um, but it did, it did seem a little amateur. Some of the acting, I, I think someone commented earlier, and I'm gonna see if I can find the comment. Brooks Durham said, I ended up watching some of it, but I couldn't get through it. The acting was just awful. Felt more like a long skit. Yes. That's exactly the way I felt with the acting. It just seemed, it seemed stilted. It seemed like they were doing a skit, uh, especially with Matt Walsh. I guess that's kind of a problem with putting in personalities because it's not like he did like a horrible job. I, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't like Oscar worthy performance. But there's never been an Oscar worthy performance for a comedy. I mean, comedies are just that's just just a genre. And um, but it's like you you have that image of Matt Walsh, and then now you have him in this context, and it's like there's like this breaking of your brain trying to trying to have a suspension of disbelief, and it just doesn't it just doesn't work. So that that was that was uncomfortable. That was kind of weird. Some of the acting from Crane and Company was because they had a the Daily Wire has their their sports show called Crane and Company, and it's their acting was was subpar. Uh, the guy Alex was a pretty decent actor, but he played a he played a guy who ends up actually becoming trans, and I don't know it. I don't know. I don't know. It not a fan. I don't know. It wasn't very good. It did feel like it was yeah, like the the style of it. It very much felt sitcommy. It felt like a sitcom. And it wasn't, you know, that might be actually a funny sitcom actually. But I don't know. Maybe like a series of skits. Kind of like um they had the two people who did the Leaving California skits from the the Babylon Bee, the two <laughs> people who did that one uh, were in it, and this could have been more like that. I think it would have done. It would have been better, like that, like that kind of thing. Um, Ted Cruz was in it, which was kind of funny to see Ted Cruz in it. So Ted Cruz can be on a a joke movie, but he can't come on to a Catholic drive time. There you go, folks. There's uh, your public servants right there. Should we invite him on again? We have. Guy won't come on. He will, maybe he will come on now. He just published a book. They always want to. Pu- they always want to promote their books. Uh, Lori says only eighty percent. Only eighty percent of what? I missed the context there. Um. Craig says, "Bring the cup home, David." It said San Antonio. Hey, uh, Rudy, what do you think about going to, Cal- uh, to California? What do you think about going to San Antonio this weekend? I actually really want to do that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, my wife and I have been looking for an excuse to go uh, to San Antonio for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, last time we went, it was summertime, and it was the worst time to go. It was super hot, and I w- had COVID or something, and I was super sick, and man, it was crazy. The, the one silver lining to that trip, though, was uh, Maria learned to walk in San Antonio, so oh. <laughs> that's the only thing that was like r- uh, remotely redeeming about that. Uh, that trip, but I would love to go again when it's cooler. And now I think, I mean, at least it's it's not it maybe not cooler, it's but at least under it's 100. like <laughs> it's walkable. So yeah, I would love to go. Let us know if you want us to uh, to go and visit San Antonio. You want to do a meetup with us? Uh, just uh, comment now and and wherever you're watching, and uh, we'll take into account. But I think I don't know. Think if we could make it make it work. Yeah, why not? Yeah, maybe. And um, like personally, like. For me, it's no big deal. I mean, I could even come up for for a day trip, uh, go for a weekend trip. It' not really a big deal to me. I can too, but I have to abandon my family, uh, yeah, so that's kind of tough. But and that's no big deal. But they if I could mind. bring them, that would be cool. Yeah, bringing them would be uh, easier. Uh, maybe we'll reach out to the San Antonio team, uh, Sean and Richard, and see about uh, doing like a meet and greet. Head over to San Antonio and spend a few days there for the weekend. And maybe, uh, Rudy, you made this comment um, about doing the show out of San Antonio. Yeah, so we have the capacity to do that um, since we have a studio in San Antonio. Praise be to God. 
Um, so we can we can do that. We can bring our uh, our gear over there and uh, do our live stream as well. Uh, maybe, maybe yeah, not. Maybe. I don't know. We'll the, the the giant question would be: Does San Antonio have the capability to send out our signal to for video? Yeah, that was tough. Yeah. We might be able to send out the video through like a hotspot or something, but uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. We have. What's it? We'll talk about it. We'll Let's back up it. the entire studio. Oh, everything no, right now. Not do that. Everything that we we've, we've just installed. Let's uh, let's take it over there. That would be sick. That sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> By the way, let sick. me give you uh, let me give you a tour of the studio. We uh, kind of more or less have finished the uh, the studio, and let me see if I can give you a, a tour here. Let me see. While I'm doing that, I'm gonna. Oh, that's kick, crazy. I'm gonna kick it back to you, Adrian. Awesome, awesome. That's pretty dope. I forgot that we had that. Let's see. Let me oh, get it ready. Leave a comment down below. Lori said, Rudy said the coffee would taste 80% better in the coffee cup of Divine Providence. At least. At least 80%. It could be more. It could be 120% for all we know. Like if you have really good coffee, and I'm not talking about Folgers, I'm talking about something else. Whoa. Like Folgers is all I drink, dude. That's like just, Abbey know. Roast, Abbey Roast, it's going to be like 110%. Abbey Roast. You might be wondering, like, how can something be 110%? You must be a liar because you can't do more than 100%. And, well, it has some sort of uh, effect on the coffee to make it 110%. There you go, folks. There you go. Well, praise be to God. Um, so if you want to win that, make sure you call in and put that number down, 877-757-9424. You could win. Oh, you know what I didn't watch this weekend, and I'm really upset that I didn't watch it, was Ryan Garcia fought uh, this weekend, and... He did a good job. He did really good. And I saw the clips from it, and I was like, man, that looked like a really good fight. I wish that I would have seen it. So, oh, well. Oh, well. Let's see. Um, I'm still queuing it up. Still Sorry. Still queuing it up. No big deal. I'm trying to still see comments. If there's anything going on in the chat. Nope. Nothing going on. Uh, Marie says, if Texas succeeds, they need to have a really good exit plan. It's almost like breaking up from a relationship. We don't ever want to go back to that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It really, I, mean, I can't conceive of how this would work, practically speaking. There's just so many factors, and we're so intertwined that it would be, I don't see how we could do it peacefully, to be honest. And Marie says, pornography is a billion dollar industry, so of course people want to keep it hush hush. Marie says, we need to learn how to go back to good old-fashioned face-to-face interaction and connecting in person. Social media does have some good benefits, but there is a lot of other bad things that are bad. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a net negative, to be honest. Um, I say we take advantage of the good things, but we have to recognize, I mean, life would be better if we had no social media. And I get it. Like, it's kind of hypocritical because, like, this is where we get our, um, this is how we get our stuff, man. This is how we do our bread and butter. Well, that's not true. Our bread and butter is radio. But this is how we interact with you is through social media. And I enjoy it. I like it. But at the same time, I'd, be, I'd give it all up in a heartbeat in order to um, not have any social media at all, to get rid of it all. So there you go, folks. All right. Here's the tour. Here's the tour. Let me see. Drummer Boy, thank you so much. Drummer Boy. Drummer Boy. Sorry. Stop. Stop, Drummer Boy. One second. <laughs> One second, Drummer Boy. We're not ready. Hang on. Go back in the closet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go, folks. Amazing. Wow. Woo! The studio. Up. <sighs> hey, by the way. <laughs> You can tell I am not the producer. <laughs> <laughs> don't oh, ask. Man. Don't ask where he went. Uh, let's see here. Let's add a button right here. A temporary button. We're almost there, guys. Almost. Be patient. Almost there. Be patient. Let's see. 
Damon shared a beautiful picture that his daughter made. That his daughter drew a picture of Jesus and with it uh, a little prayer. She said, Jesus, I know your love. Holy days gives us the love of our virtue, charity. Very cute. Thank you for sharing, Damon. I appreciate it. I appreciate when you guys share all these things. Uh, Eileen said, I prayed for intention this morning. I hope it's a good day for you all. Thank you very much, Eileen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Really need that. Let's see. I, you know, my friend, um, my friend Timothy, his his kid is with me. uh, We were on Sunday and he, his mom was like, oh, let me step away for a second. I was like, oh, I'll carry him. And so I pick him up and he's fine for a second until his mom walks away. <laughs> and then he just <laughs> loses it. And I'm like, Timothy, you're like almost two. Like, get over yourself, man. And, uh, <laughs> and then he looked at you and he was like, <laughs> where's my mom? She's gone forever. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was freaking out. I was like, dude, he, she didn't go to Mexico. He's not she's not running away. She'll be back in a second. Like, chill. And for some reason, he just I couldn't uh, reason with the kid. Um, I was trying to have a rational discourse with a child, but he was not, he's not <laughs> reciprocating. And it, it was pretty funny because, <laughs> um, yeah, he ended up, um, so Timothy senior, he takes him and he's like trying to make him uh, stop crying. And he finally puts him down and he goes to run off and smacks into my uh, friend's uh, leg and he hit the ground and he's like, it just gives up and he just lays there. <laughs> and I was like, kids are hilarious, man. Like, I get it. If you're a parent, it's probably it's probably really frustrating. And I, I'm sure parents get embarrassed by that. But I thought it was really funny. <laughs> and I thought it was adorable. But yeah, like if it was my kid, I probably would be like, like probably more upset or more annoyed. But because it's not my kid, I thought it was adorable and I thought it was kind of I thought it was kind of funny. And then as soon as his mom comes, she picks him up. Silence. Speaking of kids, I want to share that uh, drawing that Damon's daughter did. So here it is. Let me see if you could see it here. Check it out. It's pretty good. Jesus, I know your love. Holy days give us the love of our virtue, charity. Look at that. I saw water flowing from the side of the temple. Boom, Bayakasha. Very nice. All right, let's take a look here. Um, um, Is it going to work? Let's take a look here. Will it work? Let's find out. Uh, Drummer boy, please start one more time. Take two, drummer boy. Drummer boy, positions. Drummer boy, rolling. Drummer boy, cut. Now let's go to the tour oh there we are and now let's go wider you can see Mm. this is the guadalupe radio network baby this is it keep zooming is that camera crooked keep zooming yeah the camera's crooked (laughs) dang that bothers me (laughs) it does doesn't it oh man check it out these are the panels that uh, we got these are sound panels and adrian and i installed them Mostly Rudy, to be honest. And I think I got cancer in my lungs <laughs> because uh, Adrian's dad, Mr. Fonseca, he uh, let us borrow his saw, very generous of him. And uh, while I was cutting, I didn't have the sense to put on a, uh, a respirator. <laughs> so um, I was cutting these panels. I think they're made of foam. And there was like these little tiny micro particles in the air. And I was telling Adrian, I don't feel so good. I'm not, not really feeling all, feeling all that great here. Hey, you probably um, have cancer now. I probably do. There I am here in the producer's room. And let me pan over here. We got those beautiful GRN sound panels. And we got Adrian Fonseca right here. He looks very pale. We don't really use this camera anymore for people because you can tell it's like. Yeah, it doesn't look very good. Look how awful the skin tones look. Um, we've, we've tried to dial it in, but it's not, it's not all that great. So we have some panels over here as well. Miguel says we need more cowbell. Yeah. We also have our jingle bells from the Sherathon. Yeah. 
Yeah. So anyway, there's there that. Praise be to God. It's a lot better than it blank looks, walls, right? Yeah, it looks so much better than the blank walls, the black um, sound panels. Honestly, the white and black walls kind of made me depressed. Kind of made me depressed. It was very clinical. And, you know, the thing that that um, that was really tough about this, this whole remodel is that we're trying to blend – we're trying to mix two worlds. You know, we're trying to make radio and – live stream podcasting a thing and it's tougher to make that work than it sounds right because like your amateur uh podcaster he's gonna have gear that's like it has a very small footprint right so you know we were looking at that initially and we were saying uh you know how do we how do we do something like that and um and i would suggest things like uh we need, uh, you know, like some nice furniture that we can use, um, like a nice farm table so that we're having a conversation, right? And we have the cameras and all this stuff. And then I was talking to our engineer and our engineer was like, dude, that's not going to work at all. We need to have room for all of our radio equipment and all this stuff. It's, it's a lot of equipment, actually, that you, you can't even see. It's underneath the table. And so we went to the drawing board and we we're finding different pieces of furniture and like what's going to work, what isn't going to work. And to be honest with you, some of this stuff is a uh, compromise just because we're doing something that's very different. And uh, again, I just want to thank, I just want to thank, uh, you know, the people who contributed to the share because uh, you're making that happen. You are, you are uh, pioneering with us and that's, that's incredible. And we're all doing this for the salvation of souls. So. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Uh, Marie, I have to... Pff, this is... I'm offended, Marie. I'm very offended. <laughs> the She said, is Adrian wearing jeans? No. Nice. He's I not wearing jeans. I would never wear jeans anymore. I, I mean, <laughs> if you go look at like my past... You know, I've never deleted a single thing off of my Instagram. Not one thing. So if you go back on my Instagram, I don't recommend this because... It's incredibly cringe, but if you go back on my Instagram, you'll see my pictures from when I was like, I think I was eighth grade. I think I was in eighth grade in some of those pictures. Therefore, he was cringe. And therefore, I was cringe. So you can <laughs> find pictures of me in jeans. However, in the last three years, I have not worn jeans one time. I think that's right. Side note, I just want to like – point out to you look how beautiful the sun coming through honestly looks in the, the studio it's like yeah man it's really nice Here we I go like welcome lot. welcoming in the sunshine but yeah i don't wear jeans anymore i've gotten rid of those i think jeans are revolutionary so i got rid of them i've talked about this in the past right we talked about this in the show before in fact i was out with adrian the other day and we were at costco and uh you know i'm a little bit more casual than adrian and um I don't mind jeans all that much. And I was looking for a pair of jeans because uh, I don't want to pay full price for just the label. You know, they're all made in the same factory anyway. And uh, I found some and then I realized I'm right next to Adrian. I can't purchase these right next to him. He, he hates jeans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so I didn't I say anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything. He was like, oh, should I get these jeans? I was like, yeah, sure, man, whatever. Um, I was like, yeah, well, yeah, whatever you want, dude. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I never criticize anybody uh, in the particular. Okay, I rephrase that because I do criticize people all the time on the show. No, I don't criticize our our friends and people that <laughs> people that I'm uh, hanging out with. Like people I'm hanging out with, I'm not going to criticize them. Um, but like obviously, public figures are different. I criticize public figures all the time, obviously. But I'm never going to be, like, hanging out with a friend and he's wearing jeans and a T-shirt and be like, bro, why are you wearing jeans and a T-shirt? Um, <laughs> I, if I do do that, that, it's usually because I'm messing with them. But the generally speaking, nah, I never – I don't do that. Like If, if you want to do that, it's, I mean, that's your business. Uh, Marie says, sorry, Adrian, LOL. Oh, wow, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, Marie. Get it right. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just messing with you. It's not a big deal. But yeah, seriously though, I I don't wear jeans anymore. Uh, I still own. I think so I think it was 20 I think it was 2020. I decided I was not going to wear jeans anymore. And I threw out almost all of them minus like 
two pairs because I was like, but what if like just in case I want to wear jeans again? And so I was like, okay, all right, I'm gonna keep them. And so I kept like one or two of them. And it's been it's been a while. It's been a while since I've worn the one of them. So I might as well just throw those away too. Nick says studio looks good. I like the multiple camera angles as well. Praise be to God, Nick. We appreciate you, Nick. You're a grace to us. Just want to say that. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Anything else? Do 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 do. Damon sent something about the about Ireland. I gotta check that out later. We'll read that. Let's see. Marie says yes. Join us on the dark side. Uh, wear some dark jeans, Adrian. LOL. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh, yeah. You know. I mean. I would. I would wear. I would wear jeans again if I found a particular reason to wear them. But otherwise, mm, maybe not. Hey, should we move the Christmas tree in here so it's in the background? I think that would be kind of cool. Where could we move it that it would be visible? Like maybe in the corner? No, there's not a camera over there anymore. Um, I don't know. we got to figure out a somewhere we can put. What do y'all think? Christmas tree? Or are y'all like... Adrian, Christmas tree should not be up yet. Uh, what's y'all's take on it? What's y'all's take on it? Let's see. Let's see. There you go. You got a better look with the high definition cameras instead of this little PTZ. Dude, the White House just posted a picture of um, Joe Biden and Joe Biden decorating the Christmas tree, <laughs> and Joe Biden is is on the second step of the ladder. <sighs> And everybody's talking about how risky, evil it is that they are putting a old man on a ladder. It's artificially generated, though. It could be, but it doesn't it's look. AI. It doesn't look artificially generated. <laughs> but like, I mean, it's getting better and better, right? The picture looks too. Um, it looks like it was taken with an iPhone, which makes me think it's more. It's more likely to be real. Um, but yeah, like imagine putting him on a ladder. For this obviously staged photo. Like, hoo -wee. Like, he's going to, if he falls from that, like, are they trying to kill him? They might be. They might be trying to kill him, actually. <laughs> what? Are they trying to kill him? I'm serious. I, I'm 100% a, I'm a serious. Because Dude. they don't want him to run. He's doing horrible. Dude, be serious. Come on. They've killed presidents better than that. But that would be the perfect way because everybody would be like, oh, yeah, I could totally see him accidentally falling off a ladder. Like, nobody would be suspicious. I wouldn't be. If, well, I'd be kind of suspicious now, but I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> like, if he, like, was walking up to Air Force One and tripped and fell and then he died, I'd be like, nah, checks man. out. Nah, you, would, checks you out. would, I think in this situation, you would need, like, a sentimental take. And um, I think if I was, like, the PR guy for the, like for like a really shady government, I would be like, look, this is the opportunity. He died in his sleep. And we're so thankful for him, you know? He was such a good nah, guy. Nah, if he died in his sleep, I'd be so sus. That'd be so sus. He he didn't wake up this morning. What did they do? Like give him too much coffee and he like had a heart attack? He died of old age. And he had a full life. So let's not sell it. Let's not let's not be sad about it. We're gonna have a celebration. Well, let's celebrate his ceremony. life. Nah, and move on to Kamala Harris. Nah, they'll move on to Gavin Newsom. Gavin Gruesome. They'll, they'll. This is what'll happen. He'll he'll die or resign. Um, that'll give Kamala Harris the opportunity to say that she was the first female president. And so then she's like, "Look, we gave you what you wanted. Now step aside." And so she endorses Gavin Newsom. She says something like, "Oh, you know, um, it would be wrong of me to take the position of Joe Biden." So I'm going to pass it on to someone else who I think is worthy, Gavin Newsom. And then Gavin, Newsom Gavin comes out of the Logia. Pontifical grandeur you haven't seen in years. Is he Catholic? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Nick says, yes, move the tree. Nancy says, yes, move the Christmas tree. Miguel says, um, right by the window behind you. Dee says, Advent tree. So there you go. I guess nobody wants us to go to San Antonio. Let's yeah, not go anymore. I guess not. Nobody, everybody was like, eh. 
meet the CDT guys, I'll pass. <laughs> well, all right, if you insist. All right, God bless you. God love you guys. See you all tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Or I'll see you in the Telegram chat. So God bless you. See you later. for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.